to this very special event, the SIGA Seminar for the year 2008-2009. I am Barbara Miller, Professor of Anthropology and International Affairs and Director of SIGA, that's C-I-G-A. It stands for Culture in Global Affairs. It is a research and policy program here in the Elliott School of International Affairs dedicated to discovering and disseminating lessons about how culture is related to important global issues and increasing the uptake of anthropology knowledge in policies and programs. I use the word culture here in the American anthropological sense and maybe the British one too of learned and shared behaviors and beliefs, a very broad definition which, as you have surmised, goes beyond the French view of culture as limited to the arts. <clears throat> to me, culture includes even things like capitalism, for example. This lecture is made possible by a generous grant to SIGA from the GW Vice President's Office of Academic Affairs through the Elliott School's Dean's Office. My deep thanks to all involved, and thanks to you all for coming here today. Now, my introduction. Dr. Valerie Curtis earned a Bachelor's of Science with Honors in Civil Engineering from Leeds University in 1980. Then an MSc, well, Master's, what do you call it? MSc, in Community Health in Developing Countries from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine in 1988. Then went on to the light side the bright side, the right side, and got a PhD in anthropology 10 years later from Wageningen Agricultural University in the Netherlands. I hope to hear more about that. It's a good place to go for people who want to get a practical kind of PhD. Interesting. She is currently reader in hygiene and director of the Hygiene Center in the Department of Infectious and Tropical Diseases at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. She's an anthropologist among largely non-anthropologists, correct? Earlier, she has worked in really interesting places, the Health and Population Programs Division of the UK's Overseas Development Administration, that's now DFID, right? And as a program manager in Ethiopia for the Ethiopian Red Cross and Save the Children Federation, working on water issues, sanitation, and health education. In even earlier times, I'm working backwards, with just her engineering degree, she worked as a structural engineer on a building design team in London and Iraq, and as a water engineer for Oxfam in Uganda, improving rural water supply and sanitation during the Civil War. It's an interesting life. She said yes. Her areas of specialization include, according to her CV, and it's a very un-American CV, it's quite parsimonious, disgust, desire, and behavior change. She's conducted long-term field work in Burkina Faso and has field experience in many other places around the world. She's published several dozen articles and reports, including many articles in top-notch peer-reviewed journals, as well as more popular outlets. This is someone who wants to get her message out widely, and she does. The list of her publications includes, these are just some samples, such tantalizing titles as Child Defecation Behavior, Potties, Pits, and Pipes, Dirt and Diarrhea, Is Hygiene in Our Genes, is hygiene promotion cost effective, an 11 country review of hygiene, and hand washing practices in rural Indian households. And that is just a sample, it's stunning. In addition to her academic activities, she's founder of and advisor to the Global Public Private Partnership for Hand Washing with Soap. That's your baby, right? She's also the joint leader of the Center for Intestinal and Respiratory Infections, as well as an advisor to many international health and development agencies, NGOs, and industry. And we got lucky because she's here working with the World Bank. Uh, today, we kidnapped her out of an important meeting. Thanks, Val. Sorry, Bank. Um, I think it's time, though, now to hear from Dr. Curtis. So I will close by saying how pleased I am that we have her here with us today because her work brings together so many areas of this university, from anthropology to international development, human security studies, global health, international education, and international business. And because her work has impact beyond our walls on organizations and institutions in the Washington, D.C. area, in which people are hard at work trying to improve health in developing countries, and because her work so clearly exemplifies the relevance of anthropology in important world issues. 
with that, please join me in welcoming Dr. Curtis, who will be speaking on dirt, disgust, and desire, hand washing and health in developing countries. Thank you, Val. Can you hear me? Am I, am I live? Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much, Barbara, for that lovely... I'd, I'd forgotten all the things that I'd done in my life. It's amazing to hear them, uh, hear them recounted. I think I feel a bit of a fraud because I've done so many things. I'm not really any one thing. So, yeah, I may be an anthropologist to a certain extent, but really I think I'm a, an engineer at heart because an engineer, you want to build a bridge? What do you need to build a bridge? You need a spanner. You need a, a piece of wire. You need a, you need a saw. Uh, so I take tools from whatever discipline happens to have some answers to the practical problem that I had. Anthropology seemed to have a lot of practical answers to the problems I had, which were about, I mean, I started working in technology, but the, of course, technology is only as good as its relationship with humans and the behavior that they use to employ that technology. And so uh, anthropology helped me understand how water, sanitation, and ultimately hygiene uh, could become a reality for the people in developing countries that don't have it. So I may seem a bit peculiar, but there is a logic to my to, to, the, to, the, to the life I've led and what has brought me here today, uh, both to the World Bank, and you'll hear a little bit about the work that we're doing there on hand washing, but also the, the things that we've been learning over the last uh, 20 years, really, working in this area. Um, so I hope you're all feeling quite strong of stomach. Nobody's feeling ill. You need to be a little bit, uh, you, you, and nobody too squeamish in the room. So we're going to have a little bit of dirt and disgust, um, but a little bit of desire as well. Is this, is this okay? Can everyone hear me? Yeah. So um, what I want to talk about is, first of all, why we're talking about hygiene promotion in the first place. Um, and I describe something of this new approach that we've been developing, uh, which takes lessons from ethnography, from evolutionary psychology, and from marketing and how we've learned that um, hygiene behavior is actually three different types of behavior, um, and which has, I think, major implications for health promotion in general. It might actually have some implications for many of the things that you go on to do in your life. Um, so I hope you, I hope you find uh, that there's some use, practical use to all of you engineers out there who are going to make things happen uh, in, the, in your lives. Uh, so why are we talking about hygiene promotion? Well, I'm sure those of you who've worked, who know something about international health, are very familiar with, uh, with, with this condition here, for example, HIV AIDS, uh, malaria, uh, TB. We hear far less about the diarrheal diseases and the respiratory tract infections, but taken together, these two are responsible for nearly half of all infant deaths in developing countries, um, and in fact, responsible for almost every, uh, for, for almost half of all infectious causes of death. Yet, why, why is there no global fund for diarrheal diseases? Why is there no global fund for lower respiratory tract infections? Somehow, they're the forgotten babies of, uh, of public health. Um, and part of the problem we've had over the last few years is trying to get those back on the agenda uh, for, international, uh, for international interest and international funding. One of the ways we've done that is through evidence. It's through gathering together the evidence of um, interventions like hand washing. This was a systematic review we carried out. It was published in The Lancet um, three, four, five, four years, five, six years ago. Oh, no, six years ago. Oh, my God. <laughs> it seems like yesterday. Uh, collecting together the evidence for uh, the, the, the relative risk of, the, of reduction of, di of diarrheas associated with hand washing um, across. So this is the, the average reduction. You see it's almost a relative risk of two, which means a 47% reduction in diarrheal diseases. It's got a fairly wide error bar on it. We're not quite sure. Um, how, uh, you know, how, how good that estimate is. These, these study sets, for example, is a very big study, and this is a very big study, and these are very small studies with very wide error bars here. So we've combined the results and found something in the order of 47% reduction in diarrheal diseases. Interestingly enough, uh, I and mean, this doesn't surprise American audiences, when I talk to people in the UK or, or, or in India, for example, they say, hand washing and respiratory infections, what are you talking about? But I think in America, it's largely believed that hand washing does reduce flus, Culture. People, have, you've heard that before, right? It's not, it's not that surprising to you. So anyway, to us it was surprising. We gathered together the evidence again um, and come up with almost a quarter reduction in risk of, of getting respiratory infections if you're a regular hand washer with soap. 
Um, so really, an intervention that sounds so simple, um, just the book can have such a big benefit. Um, this, I'm so, apologies for the quality of this slide. It comes from a fat tome that I don't carry around with me, um, which is a, a compilation of all of the evidence we have for all of the different interventions on public health and their um, cost effectiveness. So at the bottom, the scale here is uh, the, how, much, how many US dollars it costs to avert one disability-adjusted life year. That's the standard measure of the, the, the health impact of all, all, the, all the diseases that we all have to deal with. And this is, the, for example, alcohol reduction, um, TB uh, interventions, HIV AIDS intervention. And here at the very bottom, diarrheal disease, hygiene promotion intervention. So when I first saw this graph, I thought, oh, damn it, I've been wasting my life. It's the, most, it's the most expensive of all the interventions, the least cost effective. And then my, I rang up my boss and said, oh no, I'm going to resign. And he said, no, have another look at the graph. And it's actually the cheapest of all interventions for the, for the number of, it's actually in the order of $3 per disability adjusted life year lost um, hygiene promotion to prevent their real disease. So we're talking about an intervention which is highly effective in reducing disease, but also highly cost effective. Um, and therefore should be a priority for the, if we lived in an evidence-based world, that would be what everybody was working on. Of course, we don't. Um, part of the problem we deal with is trying to change that. So obviously, it's simple. Everybody should wash their hands. It's simple. You dirty person. You should wash your hands. Otherwise, your children will die. It's all your fault. You're ignorant and stupid and dirty. Your children are going to all be sick and not be able to go to school. You're stupid. Listen to me. I'm a doctor. Wash your hands or else. Okay, so effective intervention, easy. Yeah? That, I mean, that, I mean, there's, there's some, nice, some nice anthropological studies that show that that sort of approach to health promotion is just not even, it's worse than not doing anything. People don't want anything to do with health promoters that treat you in that way. You're an outsider, you come in, you're the powerful outsider, and you say, you're dirty. Hygienism is a power issue. People who are at the top of the top of the um, status tree, tell people at the bottom of the tree that they're dirty. It doesn't work. You've got to find better ways of doing it. You know it doesn't work. So how are we going to do it? We're going to lecture and harangue people. We're going to say, wash your hands because food poisoning germs are spread by your hand. Or are we going to do it this way? This is an advert for Lux Soap from the 1950s. It's a fragrant perfume that appeals to everybody. <laughs> I'll smell nice. I'll look nice attractive. It's going to make me feel good. It's going to make me... Look at look how she's smiling. Isn't she lovely? <laughs> can, you, can you all see? What, is the, the light good enough? In the back? Of course, the, I mean, one of the reasons why the diarrheal diseases are not major killers in our countries... I mean, think about how many bars of soap or soap products have you got in your home now? How many variants of soap would you have? Maybe 20? 25 different variants. If you think about the cleaning products you have under your sinks, the soap, soap and detergent variants, we, we all have this stuff in our homes now. And we didn't get there because of public health interventions. We didn't get there because of lectures about it being good for you. We got there through marketing. We got there through, through 100 years of soap marketing. It started in the US and then Unilever, for example, in the UK, became uh, the, 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 some of the, the leaders in... in uh, they taught marketers soap. The history of marketing is, to a large extent, the history of selling soap. They've always been at the head of marketing. So, diarrheal diseases dropped in the, 20, in the 19th century due to sewage and water. They almost disappeared in the 20th century at the same time as this marketing became mass marketing of soap. And everybody got soap in their homes. Um, so, so this, obviously what I'm saying is maybe we can learn something from marketers too. Maybe we can take a leaf out of their book about how you go about getting the, the world washing their hands with soap. Um, so this lecture is really about how do you get people to change their behavior. It's a really practical engineering problem. <laughs> engineering people's behavior. Okay, where do we get ideas about how to do that? Certainly we go to theory and conceptual models. about change. There are many, many theories about how to change behavior go and take a whole lot of theories off the shelf. We may or may not like those existing theories. I actually don't like most of the existing theories very much. We'd be developing new theories, which I'll talk about. Um, you can go to evidence and experience. So, for example, marketers 
have a lot of experience of changing behavior. They know what sells soap. Selling soap, changing behavior, to me, it's almost the same, it's almost the same issue. Um, it's, they know, they have data about what works, so empirical, empirical evidence. Um, if we're actually working, say, for example, in Ghana or India or, or, uh, or Vietnam, we can go and do research, site-specific research. We can do quantitative research and we can do qualitative research to try and understand what might change behavior. All those things can give us hypotheses about what might change behavior. And we can use those, we can use those hypotheses to design an intervention, and then we can evaluate the intervention. So I'm going to talk about some of this research that we've done, um, site-specific research, um, which is theor theoretically inspired and takes a lot of lear learning, from, particularly from marketing, from evidence and experience. Quantitative and qualitative formative research into the behavior of hand washing. Um, we just finished reviewing the data. It's coming out in um, health education research probably next week or the week after. Um, so it's just, it'll be coming out on the, on, at least on the web line. web, um, 11 countries um, where what we did was to try and find out what people were actually doing. What were the hand washing practices now? Because it, often in anthropological research, we go and have a look and we say, oh, nobody washes their hands with soap. We need to do this quantitatively because otherwise you get a, you, you get a bias. You say, oh, it, it looks really bad, but actually we need to know what the numbers are, how many people are, are actually washing hands with soap and how, how many aren't. And that's quite difficult because it's a morally bound behavior and people tell you they wash their hands with soap when they don't. Um, who's the, who are the key players? Why? Now that's the really tough question. Why are they not washing hands with soap now? And what might make them want? What would drive a change of behavior? And then how do you reach these people? So four really simple questions that are not beyond the abilities of most of our partners in developing countries to go and research in, in, the, in the communities in which we want to intervene to improve hand washing. Um, and that then provides them with the information they need to design effective intervention. So this is all about, formative research is all about trying to understand what's going on so you can design effective intervention. We use a variety of techniques, structured observation, which means actually being there at five in the morning when a mother goes for defecation and actually watching whether hands are getting washed with soap afterwards or not. Because if you ask, the answer 90% of people wash their hands with soap. I was just reviewing a paper this morning where... 60% uh, of the kids in the school said they washed their hands with soap, but only 7% of the schools had soap in the school. <laughs> so there's something a little bit wrong with, uh, with, quantity, with, with, uh, with, with interview data on hand washing. Um, so household surveys, behavior trials, which are really exciting and interesting. What you do is you give a mother soap and say, take a week and use it every day at every point, at every key point, like after the toilet. Before, clean, before preparing food, for example. And you go back and interview the mother and find out how she solved the problem uh, because she knows how to make it work for her. She knows how to organize. Uh, so, for example, in India, um, soap is, if it's used for defecation, it becomes polluted. So you can't use the same soap when you come back into the household and use it for, for, for bathing. So the mothers found the solution. They cut a piece of soap off. And the small piece of soap that was cut off was kept, especially for, the, for, for hand washing after defecation, for example. Um, so, that, so behavior trials, very rich in information about how to solve, the, how to solve behavioral problems, um, and in-depth interviews and focus group discussions. Now, this, I'll, start, I'll, I'll start going through the answers we got from the research. Um, this is rates of hand washing with soap. Uh, remember, the first question was what? Um, what are people doing? Only 3% were hand washing with soap after the toilet in Ghana. Uh, 42 in Kerala, 4 in Madagascar, 18 in Kyrgyzstan. Kyrgyzstan was a real problem because in the winter, the, the water froze, and so they couldn't wash their hands with soap at all because uh, there was no water. Um, but uh, this was done in the, in the warm season. Uh, Senegal, 23, etc. On average, only 17% of people actually washing, this is on, from observation, actually washing hands with soap after the toilet. But yet, 45% we're washing hands with water after the toilet. So this is telling us something quite important about there being a hand wash habit, but not a hand wash with soap habit. So we're looking for insights and all this data about what might help us to get, to get behavior change. Now, so we, we're using, we using theory-based approaches. Why might 
how do we organize our thinking about how to understand how you change behavior, how you drive a behavior change? Well, our model's quite simple. Um, you want to change behavior, you've got to change something in someone's brain. And to change something in someone's brain, you've got to change something in their environment. And our model has three levels of brain. This is the, most, this is the oldest. This is your reptile brain. It's the automated brain. It's, it's unconscious. Um, and habitual behaviors are things that get moved down in your brain to the lowest possible level so that you can let go and use your brain for something else. So when a behavior becomes regular and, and, and uh, routine, uh, it can become habitual. Your brain can let go, and it sticks in, your, in the lower part of your brain. Motivations. Emotions drive things like disgust, things like love, things like um, uh, comfort. Things When you feel you want to do something, you feel driven to do it, that's your mammal brain, if you like. It's the middle part of your brain. Us clever humans on top have got this prefrontal cortex. We have this clever trick where we can actually see into the future. We can plan. We use our memories to make plans about what we might do in the future. Um, and so there's a third kind of brain that we all carry around with us, the planned brain. Um, and if you want to change behavior, you can try and change habit. Habit, there's only about six psychologists in the world working on the topic of habit, yet 50% of all of our daily behaviors are habitual. So we, we got them all to London for a big meeting last year, and uh, it was Anyway, there's a lot of, we could go with a lot more work to do in this area. And that's what we're doing at the moment. We're working a lot on habit. Um, so, yeah, if you want to change any of those things in the brain, you need to change something either in the social environment. The social environment means, in the most broader sense, it could be institutions, it could be the family, it could just be the norms of what everyone else does. The, the most, one of the most important determinants of everything that we do is what the person next to us is doing. If you want to predict a behavior, if you want to change a behavior, make the person next to you do it, and you will. Uh, the physical environment, obviously, if you haven't got soap and water, you can't, you can't do behaviors. The biological environment, uh, for example, if people know that there's cholera around, the set sense of biological threat is up to people who are a lot more careful about their hand washing, for example. So that's the theoretical model we use to organize our, to, to, to use to organize the, the research. Uh, what did we find? Okay, I'll, I'll take you through habit, motivation, and the planning part of it. Now, I'll take you on a digression into my favorite subject, which is disgust, which is one of the key motivations we found, and then bring you back to the conclusions that we'll draw from it. So, everywhere we worked, same finding. This is what I've done ever since I was a child. They told me to wash my hands with water, but they never mentioned soap. Washing hands is quite a habitual behavior. It's something that kids learn from a very early age, but soap is not a habit. It's not something people do. It's very rare find soap in position ready to be used for hand washing in these countries which need it so badly. Um, it's an automated response to a cue. Uh, what is it? What is, we've done a lot of work recently trying to identify the cues that are actually driving people to hand washing. So is it when you come back from the field for defecation and you notice and, 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 and you put down your pot that you've used when you've been out for defecation, that's the cue to actually then rinse, wash your hands? Um, is it, for example, the instant when a mother rinses the plate to serve food to the child, that might be a cue to hand washing because she actually rinses the plate, she might pour some water over her hand automatically at the same time. Um, we don't really know what it takes to form habits, and that we're going to be doing lots of experimental work soon, um, trying to figure out how to get people to form hand washing habits. We've got a PhD student working on that now. So now moving up to the second layer of the brain, the, the, the motivated level. Um, Comfort is one of the key motivations. Uh, my hands don't feel comfortable. I want them to smell fresh. Soap makes my clothes and my body feel good. Uh, washing gives me feelings of being happy, light, relieved, and free. So uh, marketers know all about comfort as a motivation for fairy liquid makes your hands smell lovely and, uh, and, and soft. Uh, it's, uh, it's well understood by the marketers. Um, Comfort, actually, in the, in the biological sense, is about care of body surfaces. It's something that every animal does. It keeps its skin clean and clear of, of, of sticky stuff. Um, the mothers enjoy the feeling of clean, fresh-smelling hands. Um, and the comfort motive may provide something of a benefit for hand washing, but it's not central. It's not something... Actually, some of the mothers we interviewed said they didn't want to wash their hands with, with soap before eating, for example, because it didn't smell good. And it put off, put, put off and if you're eating with your... Hand. You, uh, you don't want to eat with a, 
bit of perfumed hand as well. So it spoils the taste of the food. Another motivation, nurture. Those of you in the room who are mothers, rather you look too young to be mothers, but uh, those of you who are will recognize that the moment your infant appears, your whole life turns upside down, your whole priorities change. Uh, the well-being of that small infant becomes your number one priority in life. Of course, in the Darwinian sense, if we didn't have those motivations, we wouldn't be here today because our ancestors would have gone extinct uh, long ago. It's a basic fundamental instinct to humans. Um, and, and it's what we found again and again. But it wasn't so much a logical thing about making the child healthy. It was a desire to see the child smile, to see the child grow up healthy and strong, be loved, you know, bathing a child is a caring activity. It's not really about stopping it getting diarrheal disease. It's a much more instinctual, um, basic motivation than, than that. Um, so it's a very strong motivation for maternal behavior. Uh, the trouble was, in quite a lot of places you find it, for example, if your child comes along and says, Mom, I'm hungry, oh, food, food, give me, give me food, you're not going to stop and wash your hands. It gets in the way, in fact, of, of immediately looking after your child. So nurture can be a little bit problematic as a motivator for hand washing. Um, but on the other hand, mothers are very strongly motivated to socialize their children in good manners. Manners is something we don't talk about very much these days, but actually we all want our children to be good mannered. And in every country that we worked in, this was a very important driver. Mothers wanted to teach their children to, to have good manners so they would fit in. It's part of the, the nurture motivation. So it may be, so getting, getting mothers to teach hand washing to their children may actually be a very promising strategy. Um, status. We're all status animals. We all want to be respected. I wouldn't come to an important lecture like this in a dirty old... I hope it's clean enough for you. Uh, it's all right. <laughs> because you wouldn't be respected, you wouldn't be listened to if you turn up in a filthy old, <coughs> in a filthy old uh, pair of trousers. Um, it, 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 they say that when we are neat and clean and when they tell others, then we get respect, then we get the respect of others. So, being clean and hygienic is a very important part of your status in life. And often, for example, immigrant groups will be very, very careful to be extremely clean because they don't want to be marginalized and seen as, uh, seen as outsiders um, because of the, the status issue. Uh, if, you, if you don't wash, they look at you like a pig in the school. Um, so people care deeply about their social status. So you want to avoid being seen as dirty at all costs. But unfortunately, it doesn't work terribly well for us because people can't actually see whether your hands have been washed or not. So actually using status as a motivation for a hand washing program may not be terribly effective. On the other hand, high status people get copied, as we all know. You know what is a celebrity all about? People copy celebrities. People love celebrities because they want to learn to be successful like them. Um, so maybe respected role models could be important in, uh, in hand washing programs. Um, affiliation. Uh, basic Darwinian motivation for all of us. We want to fit in because we are, we evolved to live in groups. And if we don't fit in with our group, we lose the benefits of being in a group. And none of us can live without, without none of us can live without groups. Um, so we do what other people do. We copy other people. Wherever we are, we do the same as other people. So if I, so if everybody is washing their hands with soap, then everybody will do it. We're in a real problem here, though, because actually everybody doesn't wash their hands with soap. So what everybody does around here is not wash hands with soap. So it's a very powerful social force that keeps hand washing down rather than making it a making it a um, uh, making it common. Um, so so it's a, it's a very strong motivator, but mostly of current lack of hand washing rather than actual motivation. But if you but um, but you can use. I mean, we talk about injunctive norms and perceived norms. People perceive the norm being nobody wash hands with soap, but they do perceive that there is an injun that, that they should wash their hands with soap. And sometimes that could work for you. The idea that one should be a, hand, a soap, soap hand washer. Um, so and one thing you can do is actually have communications that make hand washing look as if it's common in society. So if every TV cook and every soap opera you saw hands being washed all the time, virtually it would be like somebody in your in your house washing their hands with soap all the time. It would make you want do it more, more commonly. So, so if you can make it just appear that everybody, even if you just put posters up everywhere of hand washing, it makes it look as though everybody's washing hands with soap, and it kind of helps, but uh, it's not easy. Uh, oh, this was, a, this was one, I mean, clearly, in a Darwinian sense, again, being attractive is a very important driver of a lot of human behavior. Um, putting, if, you, if you're dirty, you can even put away a promising suitor. 
Uh, and in Uganda, when you have a husband, you've got to show him a lot of love. So I have to keep my hands clean so that I do not put any dirt on him. So, so uh, being attractive, possibly a motivator that we could use. Remember the pretty lady at the beginning, that the marketers, the marketing strategy of the attractive, clean lady. Uh, it was quite interesting that some cultures were quite happy to talk about this as a driver, for example, in Senegal. But in Uganda, it's God-fearing. Um, it, it wasn't nice to be seen to be interested in looking attractive to attract, to, to attract one, one's husband. So one important thing about having a theory so you know what you're looking for, we might have missed that if we hadn't gone, if we hadn't gone out there specifically looking for attraction as one of the possible drivers. We might not have found it in some of the countries where people weren't ready to talk about it. Um, but as with status, it's difficult to tell if hands have been washed with soap or not, so maybe attraction isn't a great driver either. Um, so fear, that's the standard one. It's the one I showed you. you your children will die. You're, you'll all get sick. You'll all die if you don't wash your hands with soap. Actually, we found that is not a strong driver of hand washing. It doesn't make people want to wash their hands with soap. Diarrhea isn't actually seen as a threat. It's, not, it's something that is a regular thing that happens to children as they grow up. It's normal. It's not, uh, a, a, it's not seen as something that threatens their life. It's seen as a symptom of other diseases. So, for example, the evil eye um, can give you malaria, and that can give you diarrhea, for example, which is actually true, of course. Quite often you get one disease, diarrhea can become a symptom of it. Um, so, you know, to tell this germ story, which is not what people believe anyway, that if you don't wash your hands, you're going to get, get germs on your hands. The germs are going to get the, they're going to get to the child. The child is going to get sick. The child's the germs are going to multiply. The, the chain of logic is so far removed from what most people really experience um, that fear, in the end we concluded that fear really wasn't a key motivator, except in the time of cholera. Fear in the time of cholera is, a, is an important motivator. Um, so anyway, now we're getting on to my favorite sub subject, disgust. Um, when you're dirty, you shouldn't go out or meet people. You risk contaminating them or upsetting them with nausea smells. Anything that comes out of the human being is so bad. We wash our hands with soap after we eat fish. Then we feel very uncomfortable. Our hands are stinking and all. So, disgust. Here's a list of... I asked um, teenage girls to write essays about impurity in, in Lucknow, in India. And these are some of the things that they told us about. Feces, urine, toilet, sweat, menstrual blood, spilt blood, cut hair, impurities of childbirth, vomit, smell of urine, open wounds, smelly person, yellow teeth, nose picking, dirty nose, I'm jumping here. <laughs> Fish smell, dog or cat saliva, lizards, flies on feces, liquid animal dung, decaying waste, garbage dump, sick person, hospital waiting room, beggars, touching someone of a lower caste, crowded train, lower caste alcohol, betrayal, for example. What an extraordinary list of disgusting things, isn't it? Amazing, isn't it? <laughs> Rich and ripe and extraordinary. And what on earth links all those things together? Why are all of those things disgusting? Here's, here's a list from the UK to compare. Okay, starting again with feces, dog shit, cat shit, dog. Am I allowed to say shit in this? <laughs> when I, <laughs> I was interviewed on the BBC, they said, You mustn't talk about shit. You mustn't say shit. Yes, you can say poop, but not shit. But actually, I'm on a mission to talk about shit because <laughs> if we don't look at shit and think about shit and understand shit, we can't solve the problem of shit, which is you know, the problem of sanitation and the problem of hygiene in developing countries. So <coughs> shit is, uh, do we need to talk about shit? It's very important. <laughs> <Huh>? <laughs> so body parts in jars, stained toilets. Oh, my goodness. I was, I, was, I was doing the analysis of this while I was trying to eat my breakfast. And I was like, oh. <laughs> I, I, you know, disgust is largely my profession, yet it still makes me heave. Now, why is that? You know, I'm a logical, rational human being, but just reading lists of nasty stuff makes me feel sick. Uh, th this was my favorite one. Somebody had gone into a, 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 a burger bar who I shall not name um, and uh, picked up a burger that they thought was theirs and then turned out that actually someone else had already taken a bite out of it, an unknown stranger had taken a bite out of it. And a, and a story of a lady having to clean uh, a geriatric patient's false teeth in the hospital. Anyway, I won't go on. Um, disgusting things are, if you categorize them, bodily secretions, body parts, certain animals and insects, but not all. So things like lice and fleas, but not necessarily wasps or caterpillars. Uh, signs of decay and waste and off foods. Um, other people, certain other people. I mean, if you think about it, 
how many people on the planet would you be prepared to share your saliva with? <laughs> it's probably a few. You probably have a few exceptions, right? <laughs> They're not many. <laughs> so there are most other people are disgusting. There's just a few people you're prepared to make exceptions for. <laughs> sorry, sorry, you're all lovely. I'm, I'm, I don't want to share my saliva with you. I hope I'm not spitting. <laughs> Okay, other people. Um, so we, did, we ran an experiment. This was um, uh, there was a, a BBC program about human instincts, and we were trying to discuss the presenter. And that night, um, the, the experiment that we set up on the BBC website got, was actually crashed by the number of people who actually went to fill this. We had forty thousand people. It, at the time, it was the biggest web experiment ever. Um, it's, uh, no, it's now not anymore. But um, uh, and we had interestingly more females than males filling in the web survey, which is quite unusual for web surveys. Normally, it's met for preponderance. So anyway, we asked people to rate how disgusting a series of randomly presented images were. So uh, this one is like a clean wound, and this one is like a suppurating wound. So which one would you vote for as most disgusting, left or right? Okay, yeah. Well, you're right, yeah, exactly. I mean, we had P values to die for. We had P equals 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, because we had such huge sample sizes on this. So it's a massively significant. So what about that one and that one? Which one would which one's more disgusting? Mm. I'm not telling what it is, just which is more disgusting. <laughs> yeah, uh, we, we, it's actually the same photo that we just modified to make it to uh, make it look a little bit like bodily fluids. So, um, so this is kind of you know a bit of yellow and a bit of blood flecks so or yuck. <laughs> it could be soup. You know, I mean, who knows? But anyway, it was highly significantly different in terms of people's disgust ratings for them. Okay, which towel would you like to dry yourself with? Okay, the left one? The right one? <laughs> okay, it's the same towel, it's food coloring. It's not, <laughs> but you know, twice as disgusting, more than twice as disgusting, this one with what looks like bodily fluids on the towel. Uh, what about poor old Duncan? <laughs> which one would you kiss? <laughs> He's the producer of the TV show. and. Uh, <laughs> We, we took one shot of him, and then we just more, we just made him a bit pinker and sprayed a bit of water on him and painted a few spots on him. Anyway, so it used to, we just water, we just wet it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so he's twice as poor old Duncan is twice as disgusting when we met, mopped him up to look ill. Was the, was the point? He looked vaguely ill, doesn't he? Um, so why why were those pairs more disgusting than the other pair? Now, I mean, it seems to me that the answer is pretty obvious, but in psychology, actually, it's still not. It's still a it's still a battleground. It's, paper I was just reading this morning that's still arguing whether this is true or not. My answer is because being disgusted helped our ancestors avoid disease. So in the same way, if a woolly mammoth ran into the room now, a large proportion of you, or a saber-toothed tiger, would jump on your chairs or run away. Those of you who didn't have that instinct were likely to get eaten, and you're likely not to have many offspring. And in the same way, if I went around going, ooh, 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 delicious, ooh, Oh, urine, give us a drink. <laughs> Yummy. <laughs> I'm not going to be very good at finding a mate, <laughs> and I'm not going to be terribly good at passing on my genes. So clearly, I mean, it only takes a 1% um, advantage in, uh, in, in the, for, I think, in 30 generations for a, a, a new trait to become fixed. And you can imagine what, you know, somebody who is slightly more, who's 1% more disgusted, if I'm 1% more disgusted than you are, I'm going to have a 1% advantage in avoiding the causes of disease. And I'm going to have over 30 generations. My kids are going to get those genes. And yours aren't. And yours are going to go extinct. And I'm going to have more descendants than you. OK? <laughs> so um, clearly, we're hardwired to avoid things that might make us sick. And that's one of the motivations that sits in our midbrain, um, the uh, fear the disgust of microorganisms. So the microparasites and the macroparasites that, are, that, that look at us as a dinner, a bit like the way a lion looks at us as dinner, and we've learned to run away from lions. Well, macroparasites eat us from inside. They think we're yummy. And so we have behaviors. They don't involve running away like you do from a lion, but they do involve, involve if you see or smell something bad, you don't ingest it. You don't eat bad food. You don't drink bad water. And, uh, and clearly, so, you're, so disgust polices all our body boundaries. It polices the entrance to our body. It stops us eating the things that are going to make us sick. It stops us breathing in the things, the bad smells, the things that might be carrying microbes, viruses, whatever, to make us sick. 
keeps our skin healthy. We pick off all the parasites that are trying to find their way into us. And of course, uh, it makes us a little bit careful about who we mate with as well, uh, because obviously that's a super highway for, uh, for the transmission of infections. It has a double whammy because it can make you sterile as well, which was not very good for your genes either. So we're pretty picky about, at least males and females are slightly different, but for other reasons. But mostly we're pretty picky about who we mate with, and we're pretty picky about the things we let get inside us. And the disgust instinct is the instinct that makes us behave in ways that stop us getting sick. So this is the, the big theory. Okay. Uh, I had major battles with Mary Douglas about this. And those of you who know her work know that she, she regards uh, her, her, the, she was the mother of social anthropology, and she believes that her book Purity and Danger uh, was a major inspiration to, to anthropologists throughout the world. And she and I had ding-dong battles about this because she said that disgust is culturally constructed. It's, it's in every culture, we construct the things that are disgusting. I say no. Disgust came first and culture came afterwards. Culture in the English sense um, of the word. Culture in its broadest biological sense of the word, which is all of the things that we do as, as uh, cooperative activities. Um, worms are disgusted. This is a worm being disgusted. Get it to play. Okay, this is a, a C. elegans, right? It's a little worm. It's about a millimeter long. And what they're doing, what this guy is about to do, this is the worm, and he's about to put some bacteria that are parasitic on this worm, on the, on the Petri dish. And you see what the worms do. It works. Let's see what the worms do. Here he goes. Disgusting. Yeah. <laughs> the worm is running away from the from the pathogen. It's avoiding getting sick. That's a disgusted worm, as far as I'm concerned. Okay, not a disgusting worm, but a disgusted worm. Okay, these ants are cleaning themselves of uh, of fungal and and bacterial parasites. Um, grooming behavior prevents keeps body surfaces clean and prevents disease. Frogs. Avoid. Um, the, the tadpoles can tell which of their conspecifics are infected, and they avoid them. So that's disgusted tadpoles. They can sniff out an, an infected tadpole and keep it away. Uh, you're, you've probably all seen birds uh, collecting the, the fecal sacs of their, of their infants and flying away with them. Uh, it's, it's partially a defensive mechanism, but partially it's a hygienic behavior. It, you, you keep the nest clean. You don't shit in the nest. And that is true for every sedentary animal. They have hygienic behaviors. Tapirs have latrines. So do foxes. So do, so do um, badgers. It's been hypothesized that, um, that the reason that uh, caribou and reindeer migrate is because of fecal buildup in the fields. So you don't want to be eating other, other reindeer's crap. So time to move, because other reindeer's crap is full of nematodes and other parasites that are going to make you sick. Um, this is obviously a an anti-parasite, an instinctual anti-parasite behavior, uh, very common in the animal world, but uh, pretty common. <laughs> but when my, you'll kill me for mentioning it, but when my daughter got nits, I discovered what fingernails were for. They're actually, there's an instinctive joy in removing the nits and crushing them. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> oh, sorry. Oh, oh sorry, Naima. Sorry. <laughs> okay, so disgust. Disgust is the hygiene instinct, as far as I'm concerned. It is the most important driver of hygienic behaviors. If you've got something yucky and nasty and stinky on your hand, or you even think you have, if you even feel you've been contaminated, then that's the powerful driver of hand washing. It's a hard one to use in, in, in communications, but it's universal in every culture we looked at. It's um, powerful, directly related to hand washing with soap. Disgust may not last, because if you've been out to the fields or to a public toilet, as in Ghana, for example, before you come back. By the time you come back, you may have forgotten completely. In fact, mothers in, in the UK that we studied, um, if they got distracted when they were cleaning a dirty nappy, for example, often wouldn't go back and wash their hands. So if the phone rang and they were, they were in the middle of nappy changing, the hand washing would get forgotten. So it's quite, it's quite it, 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 this sense of contamination can get forgotten and get lost. But the communications task should be to make hand contamination feel disgusting. So the conclusions of all of that stuff about motivation. We think disgust is a great candidate. We don't think fear is. We think comfort might help and nurture might help. And we think 
reconciliation, in other words, norms, might be a very good driver of hand washing as well. So these are our, these are our big hypotheses about what might work. Uh, now, the human stuff, the plans, the long-term plans to hand wash. Do, do, do humans actually plan to hand wash? Um, long-term objectives in which hand washing is involved. Um, pleasing the gods, bringing luck. There's some evidence from the different studies suggesting that people made an effort to be hygienic, to sweep up, to be clean, um, for religious reasons, for example, which are planned reasons to be told. Of course, they can become habitual as well. But um, Another objective is socialize my children to be successful. So people may plan to hand wash because they want to socialize their children. Uh, and they may plan to bring good health to the family, but we found very little evidence that that was actually happening. Um, moving to the environment box, um, we talked about hygiene being a power issue, and health workers are often resented because they come and lecture at you, and, and they're, they're often not, not deeply respected members of societies. It was quite shocking, in fact, that we found in almost every interview, almost every set of interviews that we did, that actually the field workers and the health workers weren't these loved and, lo and wanted members of society. They were often seen as a bit of a damn nuisance and a bit of a cheek that they would come around and lecture you about these things. Um, we found that women were generally in control of soap purchasing use, so that's important to know for expansion design. Um, that hand washing is, a is not a perceived norm, but it is seen as an injunctive norm. In other words, people feel you should wash hands even though and they certainly knew all about how good hand washing was for you. They didn't actually do it. It was another, it was another matter. Uh, so soap was available in over 95% of households. And this is, these are representative samples from these 12 countries, which include some of the poorest areas of the countries. This is, the only country where this wasn't true was Madagascar, where it was 60%, 58% who had soap in their household at any one time. Everywhere else, it was 95, 98, 97, 99% of households they had soap. Not for hand washing. For body washing, for laundry, for washing dishes, for example, but not for hand washing. Um, another constraint was the cost, time, and effort, and money. Um, in soap was often kept carefully, put in a safe place, so that the kids wouldn't play with it, the pigs wouldn't eat it, it wouldn't fall on the ground, it wouldn't be looked after, because it's a it's a rare commodity, a precious commodity. So people are quite careful with it. Um, and yeah, I talked already about when there are epidemics. So here are our set of hypotheses about what might work to change behavior. Planning to teach my child good manners. The four motivations of which we think disgust and affiliation are the two most important. Somehow training kids to get the habit of hand washing at an early age. But also how can I train myself? How can I set up cues to myself to remember to wash hands with soap? So habit. Um, changing the social environment such that you change the norms but also such that you create a buzz around the issue of hand-washing. Hand washing is how deadly dull, how boring is it? I mean, what we've been trying to do is make it exciting. And, uh, and if you can do that, and you'll see in a minute how, how we did it in one country. Um, improve facilities, um, improve queues, improve costs, and um, maybe mess with signs of contamination might be how. So these are our major hypotheses about how you might go about improving hand-washing behavior. So how did we actually go about doing it? This is the Global Public-Private Partnership for Handwashing, where we brought together soap manufacturers with the World Bank, with WHO, with UNICEF, uh, with USAID, um, with CDC, uh, with this is us, the London School of Hygiene, uh, the three biggest soap companies in the world who never talk to each other. They're sitting in a room together now, talking about what we do about handwashing. Um, Procter & Gamble, Colgate, Palmolive, and Unilever, um, but also small schools in each country, small-scale producers and manufacturers association. Um, and at the moment, we're in uh, verging on 20 countries um, with trying to design national hand wash programs. Um, so the idea is that the government provides the social and educational infrastructure. The private sector doesn't provide soap and it doesn't provide money, but what it does provide is a real expertise in behavior change, a real expertise in understanding behavior, consumer research, understanding how to run big programs at mass scale in countries. And that's been incredibly valuable. And they've actually been running workshops, training ministries of health in how to do marketing, which has been a complete eye-opener for, for, for many ministries of health. It's been an extraordinary um, vision, voyage for many people involved in this. Uh, people like us have been trying to provide vision 
credibility. You know, the more we work with the soap companies, the more they get credibility and ours, we lose credibility. So it's a, there's, a, there's something of a, it's a difficult, there's a bit of a balance there. Um, but getting too close to the soap companies can be a little bit, a little bit scary. But, I mean, I, I, I am, I will go to my grave proud of the fact that Unilever has now committed to get a billion people washing hands with soap in India and Africa. And that's, 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 that's largely due to this public-private partnership. Uh, and we, you know, us public health people can go home when a, when a soap manufacturer makes a commitment like that. I mean, that's, that's, just, that's, that's public health on a grand scale. That's a real, real massive benefit. And then the external support agencies for providing financial resources for, for their expertise. So what are we doing in Ghana? I'll go quite quickly through Ghana. The problem was 2% of mothers washed hands with soap after defecation. Um, this is your typical, this is one of our hygiene monitors actually. Motivations we found were disgust, nurture, affiliation, uh, but they never had a hand wash habit, and there was no cues to contamination in the environment because they were going out for defecation to a public toilet largely, and by the time they were coming back, they were forgetting about this contamination. So we went through the process that we learned from the soap companies about coming up with concepts and then testing the concepts. So these are some, these are some of the concept boards that we came up with and then worked with a, um, an advertising agency, a commercial advertising agency, uh, to design concepts, test the concepts out, see what seemed to work best. Um, these are, this was the, one of the discussed concept boards. We had many. Um, and we had a massive campaign. Um, it was basically industrial strength marketing. So it was, um, the, the ads were on at five times a day for six months. They were in the local languages. Um, there were radio ads, again, in, in, uh, on 18 radio stations in 10 local languages, five times a day for six months, billboards launches, uh, community activities, road shows. These are community outreach um, activities based actually on a marketing model. Again, when they go around and have these lovely fairs. And often, if you've worked in developing countries, you'll see the cigarette companies go around with these fairs and they have the sort of dancing competitions and people get packets of cigarettes as, as prizes in, 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 uh, in, in markets. Those sorts of appalling examples of marketing but are actually could, can be used to sell soap, can be used to sell toothpaste, often are. Uh, this I think I will have to play it from here. It may need to be turned down there. Whenever you use the toilet and do not wash your hands with soap, your hands pick up things you can't see. Washing your hands with just water can't make them truly clean. Remember to wash your hands with soap. You never know what you're feeding to your family. That moment. Frictionally clean hands. Always wash with soap. That, that instant when the child picks up the fufu and is about to eat it, when you watch that with a group of Ghanaian mothers and they all go, oh! it, it's got this deep emotional impact that there's this contaminated stuff and the child's about to get what was come from the toilet, the child's about to eat it. No mention of disease, no mention of germs, no mention of doctors or diarrhea. Like we have rules in our campaigns, no doctors, no death, no diarrhea. No, uh, we're allowed disgust and you're allowed dirt. Um, so you're allowed some Ds. <laughs> So the, what was the impact of that campaign? Uh, very briefly, um, this is a national sample, 71%, including, this is, including the whole country, including media dark areas. 71% of people knew that TV ad. 69% of kids can sing that song spontaneously. <laughs> um, reported hand washing with soap went up by 13% after defecation. But actually, before eating, it went up by 41%, which wasn't quite what we were wanting to do. It was the, uh, it was, cause it, but as always, the disgusting things are a black hole. You blank them out. You don't think about it. And people think about food, but the, the toilet bit of them, if you ask, them, ask mothers to recall what, that, what happened in that ad, not all of them could remember the toilet bit, but all of them could remember the... Because disgust is a nasty... It's bad to think of, bad to think with. We push it away and we put it in a little hole. And we don't think about it, so that's one of the problems. So here's the sort of overall model of um, 
designing interventions for improving health, change behavior. To change behavior, change something in the brain. To change something in the brain, you need to change something in the environment. You make things change in the environment, you've got to have interventions to make things change in the environment. So, for example, that TV ad was changing something in effectively in the social environment um, by showing a social by showing a mother in a social a social environment. Now, what we what I've been describing is the formative research that we did to try and understand behavior, to try and understand what's happening in brain, to try and understand people. And you take that formative research and you put it into this process here of design and testing. Now that's magic. That's not this is science. This this is side of it. This bit isn't. This bit is what creative types do. Creative types with their ripped jeans and their, and their dirty old shirts are fantastic at coming up with lots of wonderful ideas. Uh, and, and, and us as more sort of scientific types have to filter. We were doing this yesterday with, uh, with, with trying to design a hand washing tool with a, with, a, with a private sector company. And their, their creative types came up with lots of amazing ideas. And then we had to filter them out and say which ones were good and which one weren't. But at which we're still very puzzled about how you can actually make that design process more systematic. Um, and then the standard program um, will have a monitoring and evaluation component which will tell you whether um, behavior has actually changed from baseline to, to, to the end. Trouble is that that standard approach can take, you know, it can be three years till you've got to the end of your program and then you find out that it hasn't worked. So what do you do? So I think the formative, being very good at formative research and being good at designing and testing interventions before you roll them out into full scale is probably a better way of going than the standard program approach, which is, which is, which is this. Uh, this is what we learned from working with industry, uh, that, that doing the consumer, what they call the consumer research and the design and testing uh, well can help, help you short circuit this long process of failing to make a difference and only finding out two years later when everyone's not interested in hand washing anymore, they've decided to work on malaria or they've decided to work on sanitation or some other important but not quite as so the tasks of behavior change cue an existing reflex or habit, activate or increase a motivation, create an objective and a plan. So those are the three. This is just a little bit of recent hot off the press research we've just completed in India. Um, what we did was get 20 families in a small rural village, in another six small rural villages, to describe their day, the routines of their day. And so, for example, wake up, go for a wee, defecate, have a semi-wash, sweep outside, brush teeth. Now, one here is one there as well. So you can see that what we did was, was, what you can see is a very ordered pattern of the day in that all the different families were all doing pretty much the same thing in the same order. Uh, so, for example, 14 families, after they woke up, were going to defecate immediately, for example. Um, so this shows a world of extraordinarily rigid, regimented, routine behaviors, one following another. There's all the families doing the same and the same thing from family to family. And where were the hand-washing events? Those are, those are all the possible hand-washing events. Now, so for example, this one here um, is a hand-washing event after going, for, after going for defecation. Uh, and that was a very routine and habitual one. Whereas, for example, um, a hand wash after sweeping here, uh, before cooking, uh, was more of a motivated hand wash because it was a response to having dirt on your hands and, fe and feeling discomfort and disgust of having dirt on your hands. So two types of hand washing. What we didn't have was the third type of hand washing, which is the planned hand washing, which is the planning to be healthy, doing it because that's what the teacher said, doing it that's because that's what the health worker said. Um, so... We think that one of the interesting things we found is that there are three different types of hand washing. There's habitual hand washing, motivated hand washing, and very rarely the sort of health education sort of hand washing that you do for your, that you do for your health good. Um, so it's a good story, but we're still struggling because we still don't really know what works. We don't have enough evidence. Th these are all hypotheses still about what might work. So one of the things that we're starting to do, because again, we're getting very fed up with this long process of designing interventions and testing and seeing what works. And the standard model in epidemiology now is the randomized controlled trial, um, where you trial different interventions against each other and see what works. It's quite difficult to do and quite expensive and quite hard to find the funding for it. 
So what we're starting to do now is screening, um, tests in labs. We've, we've just completed a study in a motorway service station where we used the, the messages that had come out of this th these theoretical domains that we found and screened them um, using uh, electronic measuring and hand washing uh, with the, with, when soap, the soap dispensers were used and laser breakers for people going into the, with people going into the toilets. Um, and in fact, disgust came out very strongly for men, but not for women. But the message that worked best for everybody was um, the person next to you, is the person next to you washing their hands with soap? Think about it. You're more likely to wash your hands with soap in a toilet if you've seen a message at the entrance that says, is the person next to you washing hands with soap? In other words, someone's watching you. <laughs> and, and even more striking, in fact, was the finding that the messages that worked best worked even better when there were more people in the toilet. So if you've seen an effective message, you know someone else has seen an effective message, and they're more likely to be attuned to hand washing, so you better wash your hands with soap. So the, the norms effect was working very strongly there. So we think that the, we think it really picked up a strong signal for a, for a norms effect. So we're now working on some more psychological stuff where we give people tasks in the in the lab, uh, which get their hands dirty. We prime them with different messages, and then we try and see what works anyway. So this is a slightly different way of going about designing health promotion, uh, testing health promotion messages. So that was uh, so. Um, Disgust, do it, desire. <laughs> if we're going to get good at getting people to change their behavior and save lives, we've got to really understand what's driving the behaviors. Um, probably do it based on theory. Um, and, uh, and we've got to do a lot more finding the funds to get out there and do these programs and get them tested and get the evidence as to what works. We need a lot more, a lot, lot more data on that. So uh, if we can do all that in the next few years, then hand washing really does stand a chance of being one of the major contributors to public health in developing countries. Save those million lives that we're hoping to do in the long run. Thank you very much.